I'll be uh, sitting while delivering lectures. Assalamualaikum. A very good afternoon uh, to uh, all the physical and also online audience. This is a repeated lecture on um, favorite answer and questions, actually question and answers in the emergency department regarding COVID-19. Siapa yang dah dengar hari selasa hari tu? Tak ada. Okay. Oh, Diva dah dengar. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're sitting at the back. Oh, online. Online. Okay. How do I come about with this presentation? Actually, during this uh, fourth wave, so-called fourth wave, uh, I receive a lot of questions from you guys uh, every time after tutorial from uh, some of the emergency physicians from other hospitals. They keep calling to us for the uh, some guidance on the management. And these questions are being repeated, actually, by uh, different uh, MOs or specialists. So what Dr. Mada uh, advised me, so I compile the questions and prepare the answers. So here, today, uh, I list out eight most commonly asked FAQs in COVID-19 in the emergency setting. So the first one is, uh, how do you make a safe disposition in a mass screening area? Happy hypoxic, when is the point of intervention? I think this is the most commonly asked question. Okay. High flow nasal cannula, how do you use it? Awake prone ventilation, does it work? Uh, medication, palliative, how do we go about palliative therapy in COVID-19? When do we uh, off pack a dirty patient to clean zone? Meaning uh, when is uh, a COVID-19 patient no longer infectious? And lastly, post-acute COVID-19 syndrome, what do we look for in uh, emergency department. Okay, let's go to the first questions. I have so many stable COVID-19 patients in the mass screening area. How do I make a safe disposition decision? This was asked to me by one of the Northern uh, District Hospital EP when they were swarmed with a lot of COVID-19 patients. And half of them are stable and half of them were on oxygen. Okay. Yeah, you use the warning signs, patient oh, oh. logistic issues to make decisions. You can uh -huh. also um, facilitate your decision by uh -huh. performing lung ultrasound and also uh -huh. toxic tests. So this is lung ultrasound. Why do we do lung ultrasound in the mass screening area? Uh, I think you are already an expert in this, most of you, because it rapidly diagnosed category three COVID-19 patients. Okay? So we use uh, rubric lung ultrasound scoring system, which uh, produced nine years ago, 2012, which categorize or score the lung scan from zero to three, okay? What are the changes? You can see score zero for normal. Okay. Normal plural, A lines. Score one, if you can see interrupted plural with some B lines, score, uh, score, score one, sorry. Score two, when you can see subplural consolidation and score three, when there is large consolidation. So what does it mean? So it reflects the degree of aeration of the lungs. The higher the score, the more uh, the lungs area being de-aerated. Okay, so the higher the score, it means that the worse the COVID pneumonia is. Uh, keep on skipping some slides. Okay, but where to scan? Oh, they skip slide. Yeah, you skip. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of method. Some uh, studies or recommendation uh, scan a uh, 16 sector, for example. So, uh, so that the 16 se uh, sectors. Uh, ada yang 14, ada yang 12. 
So the more sectors you scan, the more time that you require. So we do it in 12 sectors. Lah. Okay, four anterior and two posterior. Two, later, uh, two anterior, two lateral and also two posterior times two. Okay. So the maximum score will be 36. Lah, kan? Tiga kali, 12. Okay. So what about the distribution? Okay, in a um, cat three, or the first changes you would see at the basis posterior right lungs. So don't forget to scan at that area. When you scan the pine anterior, they're all A lines, that the uh, subplural consolidation or no plural uh, interruption. You have to look hard at the back. Okay, the posterior base. When uh, COVID 19 pneumonia worse, they distribute. They will be uh, distributed in patchy, asymmetrical, multi-loba, bilaterally. That's why we have to scan 12 sectors. So when it worsens, it will become generalized. So you will see confluent B lines almost in all quadrant ataupun sector. Okay. Um, adakah dia punya scoring significant, penting? Normally, kalau dekat CMSA or screening area, you just want to have some changes to diagnose this patient COVID uh, pneumonia cat 3. Uh, then you stop, then you admit because you want to save time. Betul tak? Uh, but in the um, maybe the hospital setting, when you treat the patient in resus, in ISO, okay, you can anticipate the outcome of the patient by lung ultrasound scoring. There are a lot of meta-analysis being done for the last one and a half year. However, there's still no international standardization of the lung ultrasound scoring. So most of the studies uh, found that uh, LUS were done uh, 12 to 16 quadrant scanning and the scoring also is almost similar. But then they found that those lung scoring less than 16 associated with a good outcome. The patient normally will be discharged alive. Okay? And the score of more than 25, or some studies state 22. So most likely the patient will be intubated and admitted to ICU. So you can use that to predict the outcome or to pick up which patient that you need to intubate. Okay. okay. All right, so we are done with the lung ultrasound. So I think every everyone is familiar with the lung ultrasound. So what about um, if you don't have LUS, lung ultrasound, but you have a lot of patients stable, what is the patient that discharge or which are the patient that you need to admit? What you can do, you can do sit to stand test ataupun uh, exertional hypoxia, hypoxia test. So some of you may have uh, seen this video, how we perform SPS. You can use this to screen stable patient without any chest x-ray or lung ultrasound to pick up a potential COVID for patients. drop in saturation by 4% or more. So you don't do this for patient yang memang dah already hypoxic, less than 94% saturation or patient with knee problem. And this is actually a modified test which uh, normally being done by a rescue clinic for their rescue patient, patient with pulmonary fibrosis or chronic lung disease to assess their functionality. Lah. Okay, so in HKL, we have agreed we have agreement with the medical uh, department to use lung ultrasound plus uh, SPS test mm -hmm. as a criteria of admission. We don't need chest x-ray. Okay. Any questions? 
Ian, you buat tak STS? Uh -huh. Yeah, correct. Correct. So it will cut time. Uh? Time for emission. Mm. When you say the potential are kept for uh, category the mm. uh, does it mean that uh, we don't see the patient uh, hypoxic that means that? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Every patient is hypoxic uh, on exertion. So when you admit the patient, you uh, you advise the patient to uh, fully CRIV. Because normally they will decide when the patient goes to the toilet. That's a very common when your scenario, actually in the ward. Okay. Online audience, boleh soalan. Nanti Dr. Fadli tolong uh, tanya kan. Okay. Yeah. Right, we move to the question number two. Uh, my patient saturation is 87%, but he is smiling and talking to me. Should I put the patient to sleep now? Kan? It's very common, kan? common condition. Tengok saturation 88, patient boleh cakap-cakap uh, lagi and patient deny they are being breathless. Betul? So how do you tackle this? We have to understand that oxygen therapy depends on the progress of the disease. The initial respiratory uh, failure, which is hypoxic failure, um, patient normally have normal lung compliance. The lungs, even though with some consolidation, the, the compliance is normal. So therefore, uh, it gives a lack of correlation between the degree of hypoxia and also the respiratory mechanics. Saturation 88, patient denied being breathless. Okay. So this, uh, of course, cause uh, any confusion and then doubt uh, to us, okay, whether we should take over the ventilation or not. Suddenly, the patient decide on us. Tiba-tiba, dah pergi toilet, datang balik, Remember, perform prayers and tiba-tiba they're gasping and the saturation drop further. And because we know uh, that is a COVID-19 follow-up, the rapid development of refractory hypoxemia. Refractory, you give high flow mask pun, they akan improve with poor response to oxygen therapy. So, macam mana kita nak intervene before this point happen? So, what are the clues? So, you have to understand the pathophysiology of happy hypoxic. It is not due to the lungs problem per se. At least other bigger factor, the HB, okay, the uh, vessels, and also the lungs. So there will be a bilateral patchy lung involvement. Certain part will be uh, hyperinflated. Certain part will be hypoventilated. And there is also embolic phenomenon, uh, phenomenon in the pulmonary circulation. And this increase the dead space. So this is in the vessels. And the HB itself, there will be left shift of the oxygen dissociative curve. Okay, with all the consolidation, it will cause shunting. And this cause refractory uh, to oxygen therapy. Next step, there will be loss of hypoxic pulmonary vessel constriction and worsen consolidation and atelectasis. At this moment, with this pathophysio, the lung compliance is still normal. So the uh, tidal volume that generated by the patient is still adequate. Therefore, to achieve the minute volume, patient does not have to hyperventilate. So even though patient is hypoxic, they deny being breathless. But at one point, when the consolidation and atelectasis worsen, so patient cannot open up the lungs already. So the tidal volume becomes small. So in order to achieve a targeted minute volume, the patient will start to hyperventilate. So this is point of compensation. Okay. But then, uh, with worsening of consolidation and also uh, atelectasis, CO2 will start to rise. This is a late changes already. This is a late point. So I call it the, the beginning of the end. If we wait for the CO2 retention to intervene, it is too late. Okay. Issue hypoxia occur when the PaO2 drop around 40 to 50. You uh, notice when the patient is still conscious, alert, happily talking to you despite of hypoxemia, yeah. uh, did you notice that the lactate is always normal? Normal, right? 
until the PaO2 drop to 40 to 50, then the lactate will begin to rise 3, 4, but at the low, uh, apa ni, low abnormal. Lah. Okay, that when that is when uh, there is exhibition of tissue hypoxia. Perasan tak? Okay. So, bila kita nak intervene? Kalau you nampak graph ni, this is point of the decompensation. So, we have to intervene before that point. Okay. Patient may have intrapulmonary shunting, uh, intravascular uh, microthrombi. Okay. At the point of patient becomes deep sleep, kita kena intervene. So, apa clue dia? So, the shredded white thing there at the middle is the separation point uh, between invasive and also non-invasive oxygen therapy. You have to consider invasive ventilation in the presence of one or more criteria. Patient clinically have shallow breathing, tachypneic and anxious. Uh, on the ABG, okay, you find hypoxemia with worsening of respiratory alkalosis. It is not acidosis, but alkalosis. Lung score of more than 22. When you scan the lungs, there is, in, uh, there is involvement of the uh, anterior and upper segment or sectors of the lungs. Yeah? Chest X-ray, the opacity uh, extend up to the mid zone. Uh, this is very important. Uh, poor cardiac function. Okay. And also evidence of other organ injuries. So you have to consider invasive intubation. Okay, as opposed to high flow nasal cannula with awake prone, uh, we have to start early where the patient still have good respiratory effort. No respiratory alkalosis. Lung score is less than 15. The chest X-ray opacity confined to the base. Uh, patient have normal cardiac function and absence of organ dysfunction. Okay. So I think the key point here is the clinical condition and on the ABG, worsening of respiratory alkalosis. So, okay, like I said, the video, look for. So if you have a hypothetical blood gas, a series of blood gas of a patient who have a worsening of respiratory distress, good point. Are you uh, uh, online, uh, okay. Okay. So, I'm going to intervene. Point with C, you have a C. Mm. Yeah, you uh, on high flow. Mask, you uh, can on high flow. Mask, you can see on high flow. Mask, you Dia tanya dalam hati. Doktor boleh dengar. Okay. <laughs> okay. Betul. C. Kenapa bukan B? Itu. FAQ. Boleh kalau clinically patient is exhausted? Boleh. Boleh. But the point is that you don't wait until the CO2 runs. It is too late already. The Meaning that the lung compliance is very bad already or the patient is very exhausted. And you don't wait until, uh, you don't sit on the normal ABG when the patient is hyperventilating with the pneumonia. Because you know hyperventilating patients should not have normal CO2. They should have a CO2 washout. Faham tak? Okay. So yang dekat A and B, or even A, so apa intervention yang you boleh buat? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, six. Yeah, class three. Why B was the answer? B can be the answer actually if clinically the patient is exha uh, exhausted. But on the ABG, okay, uh, you can. Uh, I think the best time on the ABG is C. You see the worsening of respiratory alkalosis actually. <laughs> Correct, correct. You can try if the patient on high flow uh, mass, you can uh, change into high flow nasal cannula with some peak high flow and prone the patient, which I will uh, explain later on. Uh, 
Iya. Di coba. Hmm. You have to match with the patient's clinical condition. You have to match. You cannot, you cannot make decisions solely on uh, based on the ABG. You have to match with the patient's clinical condition. Whether the patient being breathless, patient uh denied uh, patient nampak comfortable talk in full sentence and so on. Tak sama pun jatuh. Hmm. Ini record kan? Okay. So this is uh, apa namanya a uh, six criteria or uh, indication for intubation. Uh, this is article in press lah, belum publish lagi. Okay. Ah, uh, boleh tolong uh, mute kan uh, mic tak? Uh, make sure you all mute the mic, yeah? because uh, this session be is being recorded. Thank you, thank you. Okay, when the patient tell you that they are exhausted, saya dah letih lah doktor. Ah, uh, that is ah apa dia mana a very significant alarm. Okay, all you see on the blood gas is uh, worsening of respiratory alkalosis. So you see a progression of tachypnea despite of Hypothyroidism and prone position. Saturation is not more than 80, 85%. The rest, sorry, altered mental status is organ dysfunction. Okay. Progress to multiple organ failure is a clear cut or severe myocardial dysfunction. Uh, kalau la patient tu tak ada respiratory alkalosis pun or even at the point of B, but the patient have severe cardiac dysfunction, please just take over the ventilation. Okay, because the act of the breathlessness too. Dia uh, makan 50% of the energy. So you better reroute the energy to the heart lah and take over the ventilation. Faham tak? Ada soalan? Clear bila indication? Sekarang ni uh, clear kan? Indication datang semua cat for yang Yang memang severely hypoxic kan? Jadi saya Mm. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so, uh, uh, current condition is a, a bit difficult for us uh, when uh, the um when the patients exceed kita punya capability of monitoring, kan? but we try our best. Okay, right. So next questions, what are the pros and pitfalls? Okay, for the sake of junior and old who are listening, what is high flow nasocranial actually? It uh, provides humidified and heated oxygen with a high flow up to 80 liter per minute. Our new basic high flow nasocranial, yang part yang baru semalam kita dapat tu, dia allow uh, uh, flow as high as 80 liter per minute. Yeah. There are many variables. It depends on the type of hypo nasocranial. Ada yang provide PIP. Okay, flow memang lah satu. Uh, FO2, yes. Okay, and, and different humidification and also warmness level. So you boleh pilih. Okay, the mechanism uh, that improve the ventilation, uh, that high flow, okay, they reduce that space by washing out the CO2. Uh, and it also allow better mucosillary clearance with the warm and also humidified oxygen, reduce the work of breathing, and also provide some PIP lah, low PIP. So, uh, tak bahaya ke? Bukan ke dia ni part of the AG uh, apa nama, intervention, aerosol generating uh, intervention? Yes, but uh, there are studies, few studies that show it is, uh, it have a low risk of virus transmission. Ideally, kita guna dekat negative pressure room or isolated room and don't forget to place mask, surgical mask on top of the hyponex cannula. Jangan lupa yang tu. Selalu kita lupa. Kan? So that's why you you realize all the hyponex cannula kita locate dekat ISO 1. Yes, sebab dia negative pressure. Okay. Yeah? Okay, patient selection is very important. Very, very, very important. Sebab in the initial phase, 
Banyak tak patient yang kita start fail and then end up dengan intubation? Banyak kan? Sebab kita tend to uh, select the patient yang 50-50 Oh nak intubate ke tak nak? Nak intubate ke tak nak? Patient, uh, patient selection, we have to start early Those yang with mild to moderate, not severely in respiratory distress Rate dia dalam 28 to 30, saturation around 92 PF ratio between 200 to 300 Bukan less than 200. Less than 200, it increase the failure rate. And patient must be hemodynamically stable. So it's very unfair for us to put a patient uh, supported with high NORAD on high fluid nasal when one of the organ fails. Faham tak? Uh, jangan lambat. Oh yes, sure. Hello. Yeah. Apa ni tak? So called data. Psychologist atau psikologi aja. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Saturation ni tujuh persen. Yeah. Bukan lapan puluh lapan puluh persen lah. Ninety two percent. Around ninety two percent. You you should start already. So what and when to monitor? So um you have to monitor the patient feedback. Sorry. On oxygen therapy. Oh, no. uh, okay. Patient feedback, clinical signs, and also ABG lah. You can use some scoring. I think uh, Azizi dah present kan? I think few weeks ago, last month, ROX index. Okay. And you may also use hardcore. Hardcore ni untuk uh, NIV sebenarnya. Tapi you boleh lah apply untuk apa dah many uh, hypernasal kenula. At uh, interval. So uh, previously, it is suggested I think Dr. Mada highlight or suggest uh, one hour after we start the hyponespinola, two hours and then four, 12 and 24 hours. So that is the interval of assessment. So we actually have the form for hyponespinola utilization. Tapi form ni dah lama tak digunakan. Busy sangat kan? <laughs> so there are the scoring dekat sini semua. With the ABG, and also with the treatment. Sebenarnya kita boleh buat study using this form. Okay, so maybe we should uh, letak uh, the scoring lah kat bawah tu as a guidance. Okay. Yeah. This question has been posed during recent uh, lecture juga last Tuesday. Memang uh, this is one of the popular questions lah. Apa yang acceptable? Um, sebab oxygen therapy ni depends on the phase kan. Kalau the patient uh, is at the early phase of a hypoxic failure, at 92%, 94%, the patient may, uh, the patient may exhibit uh, adequate oxygenation kan tak teknik dah but if that patient dengan high flow uh, mass uh, dia dah reach to the almost decompensation punya level even 92 dia akan breathless sebab this hypoxemia is multifactorial dia bukan due to the lung sahaja so uh, more importantly we look at the patient clinical rather than looking at the saturation per se okay uh, of course, IC point is at the 91%. So we try to push uh, ataupun to uh, target more than 92. Betul. But more importantly is the clinical signs. Kalau lah 92% or 94% but patient breathless. And normally kalau patient breathless ni, dia punya saturation dah fluctuate dah. Sekejap 94, sekejap turun balik 88, kalau you perasan. 85, then naik balik semula. So... Um, yeah, clinical is more important rather than a single saturation uh, reading, sebenarnya. Okay. How about the average oxygen oxygen ratio to aspirate or deaspirate oxygen? On hyponesicronula. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, 
uh, I have a uh, pose that questions to Dr. Melo, uh, our uh, head of uh, anyway, service uh, NS lah, last year sebenarnya. Because uh, we sat in the uh, National Mortality Meeting. So we found that we accepted a lower PAO2 or PF ratio for COVID patients. And we intervened uh, quite late when the P, uh, PAO2 is around 40 to 50. So I asked uh, Dr. Melo, what is the acceptable uh, PAO2 for COVID-19 pneumonia? So he said it is still uh, 60 and above. Still 60 and above. Okay. So that's a rough guide. Lah. So PF ratio pun sama lah. You may see other improvement. Okay. Which brings to okay. the next one. It falls. So kalau kita ambil patient selection yang salah, patient yang 50-50, oh saya nak intubate lah patient ni tapi dia okay lagi so I letak hypernasal cannula. So that is very dangerous because it may delay intubation. And those who fail hypernasal cannula have mortality rate of 45%. Tinggi ya, tinggi. So early identification of failure mesti uh, apa dah, sangat essential. Uh, patient selection must be correct. So the factor of successful hypernasal cannula includes young patient, those without comorbid, the less severe, PF ratio better, okay, but the tanda tanda hyperinflammation uh, with uh, patient uh, uh, come with higher lymphocyte level, so better immune system. Okay, what do you mean? So you have to start hyperinflammation early, early, as early as if your patient is on ventimas 40% and generate PAO2 of 80, just change to because the PF ratio is 200. Okay. And if your patient improve, we have learned from our mortality cases. One patient datang, very young patient, 37 year old, uh, hypoxic failure, being put on C helmet CPAC, improve the oxygenation up to 165 PAO2. Then we win down to ventimas. What happened? Dia punya, dia punya consolidation, dia punya alveolar, collapse balik semula without the peak. Okay. So if your patient improve, do not win immediately. Just carry on because it will take three to five days for patient to come off from hyponacid canola. Faham tak? So kalau patient to stranded dekat ISO 1 on hyponacid canola, for example patient Supri, Supri, siapa tengok dekat ISO 1? That ten. Uh. Uh. So, we're going to reduce the flow of the Until the antibiotics work, until the anti-inflammatory anti works, three days lah. Normally three to five days. But I think uh, on day three or day four, they berjaya the win to uh, ventimas that patient. Okay, tunggu bagi masa. And okay. and prone the patient. So which brings us to question number four. Does a weight prone position work for COVID nineteen pneumonia? So Okay, semua cakap yes lah. Siang ni bagi tadi. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kita dah ada siang ni bagi tadi kan. Apa dia buat prone? They improve oxygenation during proning in, especially in combination with hyponacid canula. So, they comes together. Okay. Uh, the outcome actually, uh, kita tak sure the intubation and mortality rate dia sebenarnya. And based on studies ataupun um, a literature review, there's no best duration or frequency of prone position. The tolerance is very important. Kalau patient boleh tolerate prone position yang lama, then just allow. Okay. A strong evidence only limited to mechanical intubated patient. Macam pagi tadi lah. Okay. Evidence datang daripada mechanical intubated patient. So these are some of the studies. Separuh saja yang ambil. Ada dua muka surat sebenarnya. Kalau kita tengok dekat sini, uh, dia punya main result semuanya improve oxygenation 
and PF ratio. Okay. But there is risk of patient going back to uh, apa nama ni, hypoxia with supine position. Kalau kita re-supine, ada risk dia dekat situ. So you have uh, listened to Dr. Liana's lecture this morning. Apakah impact proning? So with prone position, we will uh, distribute the transformary pressure better. So there will be uh, alveolar uh, apa namanya, distribution of alveolar distension at the dorsal and also ventral part. So kita release daripada cardiac compression. But perfusion, okay, if you think that perfusion is better at the basis or gravity dependent area, it, it is not actually. Perfusion there stays to the, uh, at the dorsal part. Walaupun kita prone dengan dia, perfusion still better at the top uh, yang kita prone tu. So with the opening up of the alveolus because of the release of compression and also perfusion maintain good dekat situ, so they reduce the VQ mismatch actually. Okay, so those are the impact of proning lah. Complication, uh, not much. Tak ada yang life threatening pun. Maybe you will have some transient desaturation, loss of uh, IV excess and so on. So with this non-life threatening complication, just do it. Okay, just do it. So put the patient on high flow cannula, at least wait until one hour post meal. Okay, suruh patient prone. Uh, ideally, kita, apa ni, kita support dia punya chest, pelvic and also knee, but if you have uh, less equipment or resources, you boleh bagi bantal lah kat patient dan suruh dia prone. Okay. Any questions? Tak. Kita ada enam saja. High phone nasa kena lagi department. Tujuh lah. Tujuh, tujuh. Boleh. But patient, if if the patient, I believe a COVID-19 patient does not deserve high phone, high phone mask. That's my belief lah. Kalau lah dia perlukan high flow mass, meaning the FL2 tinggi dah. PF ratio dia mesti, uh, mesti low. So, patient yang uh, patient yang improve ataupun patient yang require venti mass 60% or high flow, uh, high flow mass 50 liter per minute, I think they deserve high flow nasa kanula. Actually, this patient akan deteriorate lah kalau kita monitor well. Okay, itu uh, itu adalah uh, ah yeah, uh, ya mesin ni ni lah. It depends juga on our uh, pressure, uh, oxygen pressure. You tahu kan pagi ni kita ada oxygen pressure uh, problem. Pressure dah satu bangunan ni drop and patient disak ramai ramai. Okay. Which one? Ya, ya, ada generator juga itu. Ya, ya, that's the omnia. Itulah yang kita patahkan minggu lepas. Okay, so kita tak boleh guna yang tu. Azizi ke buat? Itu kita tak boleh pakai lah. Kita tunggu apa nama ni dia punya replacement. Yang tu. Okay. Uh -huh. uh -huh. mm. So we still um, macam be aware of that post yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Ya, yeah, kalau dia minta makan, then you allow already. Uh, uh, one hour, baru you perlu balik. Ya, yeah. so, nanti dia akan. Hmm. Ya, yeah, alright, betul. Uh, kalau dah habis satu dah sekarang lah, uh, some people use modified CPAP. Dan even uh, some, uh, some people uh, dapat buat ini. Modified CPAP, ya. Yeah. Okay, satu question number four. We go to question number five. Uh, all the medical therapy when and who to prescribe. I think this is uh, depend on the local setting. But what you need to know, uh, you have to understand whether it is uh, viral directed treatment or the host directed treatment. Of course, antiviral kita bagi early during the viral replication phase. Okay, which normally patient does not exhibit any symptoms. Good, betul. Okay. And anti-inflammatory, we give for patient in uh, systemic phase with hyperinflammation. Uh, hyper okay. So uh, based on study, only uh, DEXA yang apa namanya found to be uh, evidence-based to be used in COVID-19. Pneumonia, those uh, who require uh, invasive mechanical ventilation or oxygen. Those who does not require uh, Tak perlu. Okay. Because they can uh, reduce the, all the inflammatory uh, mediators, the human, uh, the uh, immune response of the host to the host itself. Uh, be careful, okay, know your patient's uh, state actually, whether it is hyperinflammatory or hypoinflammatory, because 70, up to 70% of COVID 19 patients. Uh, are in the hypoinflammatory state, which DEXA or steroid can give uh, harm actually, okay, increase uh, risk of infection and so on. So at least the patient come with hypoxia, with temperature, hydrate fever, and follow up with CRP. So don't forget to send CRP, LDH, ferritin, D dimer when a patient arrives. <laughs> For what? For DEXA or for uh, oh, PAVI? PAVI. PAVI is a specialist uh, item, uh, specialist decision. So, if they come awal, day three, spike of temperature, uh, and then uh, CAT4 requiring oxygen, or CAT3 with warning signs, then you tell the specialist. Okay, kita boleh start PAVI. But, uh, monitor ataupun uh, find out whether the patient ada AKI ke ataupun liver injury atau tak. So those are the contract indication. Kalau maksudnya yang orang dah establish SRS, should be issue. Ah, dia tak ada dose adjustment ya. Tak ada. Tak ada. Tapi uh, selection must be correct lah. Sebab kalau kita bagi dia lambat, it, it doesn't work. Dalam primary phase ataupun uh, systemic phase, jadi tak jalan lah. Sebab dia there is viral, viral uh, apa ni, directed therapy. Sebab nanti dia tengok graph viral load. Kat mana dia drop. Okay. So this is a consensus of our department and also our uh, department pharmacies. Okay. Uh, DEXA, yes, you give for all CAT4, CAT5. And pregnant, you may use uh, pregnisolone or, or hydrocot. You boleh refer yang ni, kita akan edarkan. Methyl prep for uh, organizing pneumonia. This is a EP and NS punya item. Okay. Uh, Klexin. Yeah. Huh? Uh, in HKL, we give eight normally. Eight. Unless the patient's requirement of oxygen is high, venti uh, mass 40 and above, then we give 20. High flow nest granula, we give 20. Oh, that's mm -hmm. uh, you say yeah. we keep it only for hyper mm -hmm. If the patient came in uh, carrying oxygen, mm -hmm. but low fever, CRP is uh, borderline high, mm -hmm. do we still have oxygen? Uh, advisory, no. no, no. Uh, and then, uh, let's say, if the community mm -hmm. uh, usually it was high that it's moving down, mm -hmm. it's Kalau dia initially high, ada temperature, then you continue lah. You continue. Yeah. Despite the uh, normalization of the 
Yeah, mungkin the trend normalization tu is due to the DEXA. Okay. Unless the CRP memang low daripada awal. So you may uh, may consider to uh, stop before. So uh, Klaxon, yes, you give to all Cat 4, Cat 5. But we have, uh, by today, by this morning, we have some problem with uh, Klaxon uh, stock. Okay. So we can use Fonda based on their uh, body weight and also creatinine clearance. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Question number six, palliative treatment. Who and when, or uh, how to decide? The principle is okay. This is based on the MSIC consensus statement. Uh, March this year, principle must be individualized. Uh, tak sama semua orang. Age should not be the a factor. So you have to look at the comorbidities, the frailty index, uh, benefit of treatment, prognosis, life expectancy, and also the patient wishes. Okay, any form of life-sustaining treatment, including intubation, should be considered a trial. Kalau kita tak beri, kita tak tahu dia respon atau tak. And this intubation, a ventilation, will uh, exhibit the outcome ataupun response after like 7 to 14 days of intubation. Lama dia, nak intu, uh, lama dia punya effect tu untuk tengok dia punya outcome. So, kalau kita tak intubate, kita tak tahu. Betul. Especially cat 4 yang teruk. Okay. Nanti uh, 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 ada satu uh, apa dalam ni condition that I would like to highlight. Okay, DNA CPR. Apa maksud dia? Withhold uh, CPR before cardiac arrest occur. This does not include the life uh, sustaining therapy. Seperti hydration, analgesia, you still have to uh, administer. It should be a team consensus and all family members okay, with family members or not. So family members bukan the decision maker. Okay. In our setting, ideally two specialist decision. But you can always use one EP lah decision sebenarnya. Dengan siapa kita nak reveal that ataupun discuss that DNA CPR, kalau patient tu conscious alert, 80 years old, cat 4, hypoxic dan dia faham dia cakap apa, dia bagi tahu dia lah. Kan? Bagi tahu the plan of the therapy. But if uh, he's incapable of making decision, you bagi tahu the family members, the surrogate. Okay, based on the patient wish and also ex uh, apa nama ni? Expectation. <coughs> Kalau tak ada langsung, kita uh, apa nama ni uh, consult the hospital committee which we have Never done before. Kan. Dr. Mahada pun komite hospital. So, boleh lah consult dia. Okay. Okay. So, we, when should we withdraw the LST? LST ni semualah intubation, hydration, support, hemodynamic support. When you think that the death is imminent, kita dah treat, poor response. There's worsening or persistent multi-organ failure. Patient develop massive stroke. Oh, dah CPR banyak kali. Okay, so kita bolehlah bincang untuk withdraw, stop. Okay, so it is your decision. Intubation is your decision. Withdrawing point is your decision. You tak pergi dekat family, cakap oh, uh, apa nama patient, cat 4, hypoxic. Uh, do you agree for intubation? No. It is your decision. You decide in a team. You document, then you go to the family members and bagi tahu. So we decide to intubate your mother because of these of indications. Faham tak? Okay, because we have one patient that uh, pre-morbidly well, uh, independence, 61 year old, datang cat 4 or cat 5, and we ask the family members, do you want us to intubate uh, your wife? Uh, and the orang pun memang, tak tahu lah, Anti ventilator, I tak sure. <laughs> so uh, I know we had one. But the patient, uh, apa nama ni? After three days in our department, died. Fine. So we don't know. Kalau kita intubate, maybe the organ dysfunction reverse. Fine. So you beri dulu. Unless the death is imminent 
Oh, you tengok the heart fully contracting. Tengok kidney shrunken, hyper echoic, multi organ failure uh, already. So you may decide otherwise. Huh? Boleh. Okay, how to do that? After documentation, inform the family members, allow video call. Uh, terminal winning rather than terminal exhibition. Check kejam pula kan. Ni bagi sedation, morphine. And uh, bagilah kami tengok last hours. Okay. Second last question. Bila kita nak off tag a post ataupun a COVID-19 patient to clean zone? Kan sejak antar risas lah. Sejak antar risas satu kan lah. Risas dua kan. Patient uh, apa ni breathless. Okay, by consensus, CDC COVID-19 summary key findings, they set at day 10. Tapi HKL consensus, kita set at day 14. Day 14. Okay, because the... Apa nak balik? Replication competent virus is hydropod. Okay. But if the patient have severe infection or have uh, immunocompromised uh, apa ni, condition, so it can be up to day 21. So careful lah. Day 21. Kalau kita tengok dekat sini. The okay, virus no. Dia start to uh, raise sebelum symptoms occur. So dia boleh jadi infectious. Waktu dia asymptomatic. And it peak on day 2. Day 6 dia dah drop dah. So normally patient yang datang kat kita yang cat 4, cat 5 tu. Dia infectious. Infectivity taklah tinggi sangat. Mam tak? So day 14 dia disappear. Okay, certain study shows up to day 10. CDC summary ambil day 10. So kalau patient tu datang dah day, four, day 15, tapi datang dengan breathlessness, fever, you still can reroute the patient to resus 2 sebenarnya. Kalau you tak certain, you ambil, you tengok FDC dia, white cell 20. Lungs dia bukan uh, apa ni typical covid changes you boleh down triage not down triage you boleh re triage the patient boleh sebab yang penting kat sini the infectivity of covid-19 okay okay lastly sekejap dah ni post acute covid-19 syndrome what to look for so uh, bila kita cakap uh, macam kita define post covid-19 syndrome so dalam sebulan or 28 days, it is still acute COVID-19. Even though the infectivity dia drop on day 14 onwards. Subacute daripada sebulan hingga tiga bulan. Okay. A chronic from three months up to six months. Apa symptoms dia? Generally, I believe you all have encountered at least one, twice. Kan? Semua orang dah encounter kan? So we are the, at the phase of receiving patient with uh, post covid-19 sekarang ni generally dia akan complain uh, fatigue decline in quality of life dia tak banyak ambulate dekat rumah kan uh, cough chest pain shortness of breath is very common they are very common okay uh, palpitation pun siapa yang dah pernah jumpa pe patient dah okay so this is based on um Cohort study dekat US, sama je dia punya trend dekat US, Perancis, Italy, uh, kat mana lagi dalam satu artikel ni dia combine all the cohort study from multiple uh, states ataupun countries. So up to 6.7 patient yang being discharged died, 15% require admission, uh, up more than 30% had persistent symptoms and most commonly uh, dyspnea on exertion, cough and also persistent anosmia. Petofisio dia multifactorial, it is viral cause, immune, uh, our own immune system, hypercoagulability and also maladaptation of the ACE2 pathway. So you kena cari these things dalam patient post COVID-19 infection. Respi, they can come with organizing pneumonia which requires steroid or they have lung fibrosis with chronic hypoxia. Hematology both hypercoagulable state of the venous and arterial system. So, dia boleh dapat DVT, PE, uh, cerebral venous thrombosis and dia boleh dapat stroke juga. Cardiovascular is very common. Setuju tak? Arrhythmia, AF, chest pain, non-STEMI. Uh, apa lagi? Apa lagi yang you all dapat? 
myocarditis which is very hard to prove okay endocrine datang dengan dka post covid infection show pernah dapat kan okay and mis misc uh, this is special for children less than 21 year old so uh, they can come with fever hyper inflammatory markers features macam kawasaki uh, i think last few days dekat selayang ada seorang budak umur 7 tahun post covid cat 1 or cat 2 datang dengan shock hypotensive uh, require uh, inotrope and then uh, pro bnp more than 1000 so heart failure hmm. okay so they mimic kawasaki so those are the complication we don't know because we don't receive many pits patient kan and uh, it is a viral in nature selepas elderly the younger generation and they will try to unlock the key into the youngest generation body which are the children and you see now uh, apa di, current currently children are more susceptible more children are being infected so you have to look hard for this complication okay this is my last slide so this is one of the patient, I tak blur dia punya uh, muka lah, pakcik ni Datang day 32 tak silap, COVID cat 4 with PE on Rivaroxaban Memang ada IHD, they complain of uh, cent uh, central chest pain but no breathlessness So very non-specific, it can be cardiac, it can be the lungs okay. ECG, widespread ST depression uh, Focus, memang ada evidence of PE Lungs, fairly clear Chest extra pun clear, trap is 3000. Okay, this. Kita tengok saturation ya. <laughs> Dia relax je makan. Saturation even drop to 69, 64% masa dia tengah makan. So the lung fiber, uh, lungs changes and the PE, so it's a chronic hypoxia. So we treat this patient uh, uh, as a non stemi they don't on rivaroxaban, so the bagi aspirin and also Plavix lah for this patient. Okay, one of the one of the patient, there's a lot more kan, yang datang a very vague symptom or very non-specific, severe pain and so on. So any more questions? Oh, cepat je lah. Yeah. Yeah. Within 90 days, uh -huh. three months. Uh. Okay, well, you are asking me on the dot 90 days. Dia boleh reinfected with a different variant after three months. So that is that patient is on the dot. So to be on the safe side, you repeat lah. You tengok PCR RT uh, apa ni uh, CT value dia mas, uh, berapa? Sebab yes, we have a new variant. Uh, this new variant pun very rampant, very virulent. So patient uh, comes on the dot. So I mean uh, to be on the safe side, I think we should repeat. So Thirty days okay. Dia tak ada risk of reinfection after thirty days. Uh, after ninety days. For the time being lah. Kalau uh, kalau virus ni tak um, evolve lagi. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, uh, this is the second time I uh, received these questions. Uh, honestly, I tak pernah diagnose lagi organizing pneumonia. Uh, I have uh, minimal experience. I, I'm sure I have missed some uh, among those yang post COVID nineteen yang datang balik. Um, I think it is not urgent from ED to request HRCT. Tak urgent lah. Tak urgent. Uh, the important to diagnose is. 
uh, for us to start steroid, um, before the patient's uh, lungs change into uh, fibrosis, fine, and then irreversible. Uh, so that is important. I think uh, maybe I should take up that topics for next lecture. Oh, you not you know what? Mm, yes. Uh, are you uh, facing uh, those kind of requests now? Banyak ke? Request. Uh, doctor tak pernah lagi? I have not encountered that. Uh. I've never encountered that so far because um, most of the patient datang is stable lah. and if they are not stable, uh, normally memang cepat lah kita DNA CPR kan patient, this kind of patients. I I know one of the EP requested for HRCT last week. Um, patient quite stable. Uh, I think it's a tidal urgency. Tidal urgency. Um, but I have limited experience and knowledge on this. So maybe uh, maybe next week kita change kita punya decision. Kita tahu kita baca dulu, kita baca dulu and study dulu. Okay. Aziz nak tambah apa? Organizing dia yeah, uh, Because dalam the city kita ada yang post COVID pun, actually they ask the city at four and then eight weeks. Uh. But they didn't uh, specify the fit setting. Hmm. I think normally when they come with uh, acute complaint, there will be something else. Bacterial infection. Okay. Mm. Okay. Uh, PE. Uh, so yeah, so look for those life threatening condition first in acute setting. Lagi, Yosh, Mazira. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 huh? Sometimes let's say even just less than thirty days, but they don't have the fever. When it comes, she was suspected Less than thirty days. Okay. Okay. Can 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 because they are no longer infectious. The most uh, color they pick up the viruses is eighty three, eighty four lah yang reported. Tapi they no longer infectious. They boleh jadi positive, but no longer infectious. Forty days. No longer infectious. No. no. Yeah, yeah, better. So you have to look for secondary uh, bacteria infection and so on. So, but, uh, consensus HKL 14 days. It, uh, to be on the safer side. Uh, CDC 10 days. But patient yang severe infection may be kept five. Uh, be careful lah. Be careful, the virus load may be still high because of the patient underlying uh, condition. Immunocompromised patient, the viral, viral load still can be high. So this kind of patient, you may want to uh, apa ni, um, put the patient in the T-zone. Tengok dia punya CT value. Hmm. And decide. Uh, depends lah, kalau yeah, mana sim symptom ataupun kalau dia tak asymptomatic daripada positif lah hmm. so, yeah, yeah. Kalau dia asymptomatic daripada PCR Kalau dia symptomatic daripada first onset of the symptom hmm.